This is aluminum phosphide. It's a highly, highly toxic chemical that reacts with water and air to form an even more toxic compound called phosphine gas. Phosphine was one of the chemical weapons used in World War I, initially by the Germans, but by the end of the war, almost exclusively by the Allies, and killed over 77,000 people. It can induce simultaneous respiratory and cardiac failure, meaning that both your heart and your lungs stop working at the same time. Just half a gram of this stuff is enough to kill me, and I don't even have to ingest it to die. Wait a second. Okay, okay, let's backtrack a bit here. They didn't use phosphine in World War I, they used phosgene, a completely different compound that doesn't even have phosphorus in it. And the solid I have here isn't aluminum phosphide, it's aluminum phosphate, a relatively harmless compound. Jeez, these chemists really have some foolish naming systems. It reminds me of that saying, you know, in elementary school, they tell you to emphasize the importance of commas. The difference between, let's eat, grandpa, or let's eat, grandpa. Oh, actually, that doesn't really work. But anyway, in this video, I'm going to be making aluminum phosphate. It's a pretty harmless solid with a variety of different applications. It's used as a vaccine additive, as an antacid, and it can also be used to make molecular sieves which are porous compounds for separating molecules based on their size. The industrial way of making aluminum phosphate is to combine phosphoric acid with aluminum isopropoxide, isoprop, isopropoxide, also known as aluminum alkoxide. There's actually a patent for this reaction online, and it claims to create the chemical in its ultra-pure form. Whatever that means doesn't really matter to me because I'm not going to bother with some complex organic synthesis using chemicals that I can barely pronounce. Instead, I'm going to do a much simpler reaction. Precipitation. Aluminum phosphate is a pretty insoluble compound in water, so it stands to reason that if I can introduce aluminum and phosphate ions into the same solution, I'll get aluminum phosphate out as a solid precipitate. Luckily, I had just the chemicals I needed to do this. Aluminum chloride and ammonium phosphate. Both are highly soluble in water, and so it stands to reason that if I can combine them, I'll have aluminum and phosphate ions in solution, which will then combine and become our solid aluminum phosphate. The reaction occurring here is a simple double replacement precipitation reaction, where the ions introduced into the solution split up and then swap places. And it just so happens that when they swap places, an insoluble compound is formed. Really, the ammonium and chloride ions in this equation don't recombine into a new compound on the product side. They just exist as ions in solution. They're what we call spectator ions. Even after the precipitate is formed, they're still just floating around as ions, so we usually omit them from the overall equation. This gives us what we call the net ionic equation. So now I just have to do the math. I'm going to create two separate solutions, one of aluminum chloride and another of ammonium phosphate. Ideally, the number of moles of aluminum in the first solution will be equal to the number of phosphate moles in the second solution so that when I combine them, I don't have an excess of either ion, so nothing goes to waste. I decided on creating 40 milliliters of 0.25 molar solutions, which should give me about 10 millimoles of aluminum phosphate. After converting moles to mass, this gave me about 1.33 grams of aluminum chloride and 1.49 grams of ammonium phosphate that I need to combine each into 40 milliliter solutions. Now, before I get too far into the synthesis, I'm going to list timestamps here for all of the steps in my synthesis, including mixing the chemicals, decanting, filtering, and a theoretical explanation of precipitation using hard soft acid base theory. So here I've measured out around 1.3 grams of aluminum chloride, which I then dump into a small beaker. I've also measured out 40 milliliters of distilled water. You can see the meniscus there is right at 40. Uh, which I'm going to add to this beaker to create a 0.25 molar solution of aluminum chloride. 
After quickly stirring the solution to fully dissolve the aluminum chloride, I set the beaker aside and move on to the ammonium phosphate solution. As previously explained, I also measured out around 1.5 grams of ammonium phosphate, which I then added to a beaker and topped off with 40 milliliters of distilled water, just like the aluminum chloride solution. This also creates a 0.25 molar solution of ammonium phosphate. After stirring, the ammonium phosphate dissolves and I'm ready to start combining the solutions to begin precipitation. Having both solutions fully dissolved, I'm going to slowly add the aluminum chloride solution to the ammonium phosphate solution and we will see a white precipitate form. There it is. That murky white color tells you that some insoluble compound has formed. In other words, a precipitate. That precipitate is the chemical we want to create, aluminum phosphate. The reaction going on here is a simple double replacement reaction. Since you start with two fully dissolved solutions, you have free aluminum and phosphate ions floating around. When you combine the solutions, the aluminum and phosphate ions are now in the same solution. So when aluminum and phosphate ions exist together like this in the same solution, because they have a strong tendency to attract to each other, the two ions combine and form a solid compound that does not dissociate in water. That's why the aluminum phosphate comes out as a precipitate. But then you might ask, why are aluminum ions and phosphate ions strongly attracted to each other in the first place? Well, that's a bit of a different story, which I'll explain later in the video at this timestamp. Initially, the mixture we create after mixing aluminum chloride and ammonium phosphate is called a suspension. Suspensions are solutions that have an insoluble solid compound distributed evenly throughout the solution. You can't see any clear separation between the insoluble solid and the liquid solvent. After letting the solution sit for a while, you can see that it isn't so much of a suspension anymore. The aluminum phosphate begins to settle near the bottom, and now there's a clear separation between our layer of liquid water and our layer of somewhat suspended aluminum phosphate. I can take advantage of this settling to isolate our aluminum phosphate through a process called decanting. Decanting is a procedure where you slowly pour out the liquid in a well-separated mixture of a liquid and a precipitate. This allows you to remove a bulk amount of the liquid before using a different technique to isolate the solid precipitate fully. Now, this solution actually isn't great to decant because the precipitate isn't fully clumped on the bottom. Usually for decanting, you'd want your solid to be packed as a sediment near the bottom of the solution. I won't be able to get more than half the liquid out through decanting, but for the purpose of demonstration, I'm still going to do it here. All you have to do is take a waste beaker and a glass rod then touch the tip of your solution beaker to the glass rod and begin slowly pouring. The glass rod provides an outlet for the top layer of the water to attract to, allowing me to pour out very small amounts of it at a time without tilting the beaker too much and without losing any of the solid. After I've decanted most of the solution out, I can start filtration. This step is hopefully going to fully isolate our solid aluminum phosphate. To filter the solid, I simply put a coffee filter on a funnel, wet it with some distilled water, and then pour the suspension of aluminum phosphate onto it. Then it's just a matter of time. Normally, I could speed up the process by using a filter flask and a vacuum to do vacuum filtration, but both of those materials are expensive, so I don't have them. So please subscribe and share this video so I can get monetized, get my money up, and buy more advanced equipment. So while we're waiting, let's go back to that question I posed earlier. Why are aluminum and phosphate ions strongly attracted to each other in solution? Let's take a step back first. As I mentioned before, precipitation happens whenever two ions come in contact in solution and just happen to bond together very strongly. More precisely, precipitation occurs when the energy of the bond between the two ions is greater than the combined energy of the bonds between the individual ions and the surrounding water molecules. So we would need to consider both the energy of the bond between the ions and their hydration energy, which is the energy of an intermolecular force between the ion and water molecule. To simplify our discussion, we won't discuss hydration energy and just look at bond energy instead. So we're really answering the question, what determines the energy of the bond between two ions? Well, when it comes to dry solid crystals, bond energy is usually determined by ion charge and size. The more highly charged the ions are, the stronger the bond, and the larger the size of the ions, the weaker the bond. This is all reflected in something called Coulomb's law. When it comes to precipitates, it's pretty much the same idea, but we have a different theory to describe it. 
is called hard soft acid base theory. Hard soft acid base theory is a qualitative theory that can tell you a lot of things from whether a compound will be soluble in water to whether two compounds will react. It's all based on this idea of having acids and bases that can be hard or soft. These quote acids and bases aren't the traditional Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases you learn about in high school chemistry, which donate or accept protons to decrease or increase the pH of a solution. Though some hard acids can decrease pH and some hard bases can increase pH. Acids and bases in this theory are defined as Lewis acids and bases. Lewis acids are compounds that accept electrons, while Lewis bases are compounds that donate electrons. For our purposes, this means that acids in this theory just refer to cations, ions with a positive charge that lack electrons, and bases refer to anions, or ions with a negative charge that have a few extra electrons. Now let's talk about the hardness of an acid or a base. This factor comes down to two things, ion size, or radius, and ion charge, as we were discussing before. The smaller the ionic radius and the higher the magnitude of the charge, the harder the acid or base is. For example, an ion like iron 3 plus would be considered a hard acid because it has a very high charge and a relatively small ionic radius. An ion like silver plus would be considered a soft acid because it has a relatively low charge while also being a very large ion. An ion like O2 minus would be considered a hard base, while an ion like I minus would be considered a soft base. Our hardness trends can also be seen on the periodic table. For acids, or cations, the trend looks like this, and for bases, the trend looks like this. We consider ions on the top left side of the periodic table to be hard acids, even though they usually have a plus one charge just because they're so small. As a disclaimer, this table is from an online source, and I personally would consider elements on the bottom left, mainly cesium, rubidium, barium, strontium, to be soft acids because they are very big and their charge is smaller. I agree with pretty much everything else though. I want to clarify that hardness in our context is really just a relative scale without a quantitative measure. We call silver plus a soft acid, not because it is really universally soft, but just because it's softer than most other acids. Ag plus can still be harder than other acids. For example, it is harder than gold 1 plus, which is softer in comparison because it has a larger radius. Now back to the crux of our theory. Hard soft acid base theory is based entirely, no pun intended, around one important idea. Hard acids and hard bases bond strongly, while soft acids and soft bases also bond strongly. Hard soft combinations are much weaker. In terms of solubility, this means that hard hard and soft soft combinations of ions will often give precipitates, while hard soft ion combinations will give soluble compounds. For our case, the two ions we have are aluminum and phosphate. Aluminum is a very small ion with a very large charge, making it a hard acid. Phosphate is a relatively large polyatomic ion, much larger than most individual atomic anions. So you might think that it would be a soft base. However, the charge on the phosphate ion is largely distributed between the four oxygen atoms. The radius of an oxygen atom is significantly smaller than the radius of most other large ions, and combined with the overall charge on the phosphate ion, it really makes it a hard base. So we have a hard acid, aluminum, and a hard base, phosphate, giving us an ionic compound with a very large bond energy, and thus one that is going to be very insoluble. So now that that's cleared up, let's check in on our filtration. We started with 80 milliliters of solution and decanted off about 20 to 30 milliliters of it, giving us a minimum of 50 milliliters of solution. The water at the bottom of this waste beaker seems to be a bit less than 50 milliliters, but that's okay, because I could see a visible solid layer on the filter paper that we can scrape off. So that's what I did. I scraped off the solid and put it onto a wash glass. In the end, our aluminum phosphate looked like this. It's still pretty wet because I didn't let the water filter all the way through since it would probably have taken too long. 
Again, if I had a vacuum filtration setup, we could have ended with a much drier solid, but I don't, so it looks like this for now. After leaving it out to dry, our paste-like substance turned into a small amount of powder. This should ideally be pure aluminum phosphate, though I have no way to verify that at the moment. It's probably mixed in with some small amounts of solid aluminum chloride or ammonium phosphate, but of course I can't always be sure. Regardless, it definitely was a precipitate, so I think it's safe to say that this solid is mostly aluminum phosphate. Mission accomplished. Mm -hmm.